Good morning. I am uh, Leon Aaron, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. I, I get to, to speak first. So uh, um, welcome everyone, good morning. I'm delighted to be here uh, on the panel uh, with my much esteemed colleague, um, Dr. Frederick um, uh, <laughs> Kagan. Um, one more chore, um, uh, we would appreciate your questions, of course, and I believe that there should be a banner uh, on how to submit those questions. <clears throat> uh, both Fred and I will make um, brief introductions, um, five, 10 minutes and then um, we'll, we'll talk to each other and most importantly to you. Um, three years ago, I titled the book that I'm writing now, A Small Victorious War. Uh, in Russian, it's Malinka Pobedanosne Vaina. And the phrase was uttered uh, by the Minister of Interior and the Chief of the Secret Police, the Gendarmes, Vyacheslav Kleve, who was um, a key supporter of the disastrous war um, with Japan, 1903-1905. Um, the full quote reads, to thwart a revolution, Russia needs a small victorious war. Um, the book records the evolution of the Putin regime toward a military state and his own rule towards what one of the chapters uh, title calls wartime presidency. The watershed occurred um, in the run-up to Putin's third presidency in 2012, and it is described um, in the second chapter of the book, uh, which is titled Choosing War. I'll be happy to explain later, um, but this is relevant because um, at that time, Putin began to replace economic progress and um, higher standards of living as the source of his popularity um, and his, his, by extension, the legitimacy of his regime um, with the defense of uh, Russia against alleged uh, 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 enemies in the West and the recovery of the superpowership glory uh, lost in the Soviet demise. Um, from the distribu distributor of wealth, uh, he became the defender of the motherland and the avenger of what he firmly believes was the defeat of the Soviet Union at the hands of the fools and traitors inside and committed Western plotters on the outside. And the consequences of this choice, of this decision, are upon us today. Um, tracing the evolution um, uh, made me believe that within a year or two, of the 2014 election where Putin essentially is going to be crowned president for life, um, he would undertake um, his own small victorious war um, against the member country um, uh, on NATO's eastern flank. In this scenario, he is, was going to be a quick in and out Crimea style um, with the annexation um, of a sliver of land um, of one of the Baltic republics uh, with a significant ethnic Russian presence and then confronting NATO with um, the decision of going to war against Russia, something that Putin believed, and I think now believes even stronger, and NATO would never do. So humiliating and essentially hollowing out the West defense, defensive alliance uh, would be in Putin's mind, the ultimate revenge for the demise of his real far fatherland, which is not Russia, it's the Soviet Union. I think that there is still a strong possibility of such an operation. But for now, Putin has chosen a different um, small victorious war. But if the strikes, and here I defer totally to what um, Fred is going to tell us, but my amateurish sense that if the um, airstrikes are followed by an occupation, the war is likely uh, not to be either small um, or uh, in the end victorious. Most importantly, it would signal nothing short uh, of the change of the domestic political regime. Let me explain. Again, um, um, Fred will, will um, tell me uh, where I'm wrong, but given Russia's dominance in the air and in the tanks, um, heavy artillery and missile systems, which Putin so assiduously and at a great cost to his state um, has been modernizing in the past decade, the initial victory over a regular Ukrainian army will be swift and devastating. Yet occupying and policing um, Europe's largest, second largest after Russia uh, country, over 44 million, is certain to become an increasingly nasty and bloody chore. When they fought for their country's independence following the Bolshevik Revolution, and then again during World War II, Ukrainians proved fearless and fearsome, uh, partisani, guerrillas. Um, urban warfare, particularly in major metropolises, Kiev, Kharkiv, Odessa, Krivirich, Zaporizhia, um, will begin to take its toll on the Russian troops almost 
from the very beginning. And at home, the mounting casualties will be met first with growing resentment. Younger brothers and sisters, wives and fiancés, and in many cases, are parents of those killed in the Soviet and Russia's longest war in Afghanistan are very much around. And they do remember the sealed zinc coffins and burials in nameless graves. They will be the catalyst uh, of what almost certainly would become a national discontent as more Russian soldiers are killed. Russians love Putin when the wars are quick and, in, are, and incur minimal losses. If Putin chooses to go beyond airstrikes, this campaign will be neither. And Putin knows it. This assumption led me to believe that the wide range invasion was not likely. Yet the domestic hedge here, domestic political hedge, will work only if Putin cares about public opinion as much as he has in the past. To be sure, of late, he's taken some um, serious domestic political risks, as when he alienated millions with his pension reform and the so-called constitutional referendum. But overall, as regards public opinion, Putin has been minding it rather studiously. In signaling Putin's disregard for public approval, a massive invasion of Ukraine would indicate nothing less than a change of his regime. Uh, the change from uh, what Daniel uh, Trisman and Sergei Guriev called informational autocracy to what they termed old style, old style dictatorship. The informational dictatorship relies mostly on propaganda, symbol manipulation. It seeks public approval uh, by persuasion, again, propaganda, the rhetoric of performance rather than by instilling uh, fear. Excuse me. Um, it silences the elite opposition by cooptation, uh, bribery, and censorship rather than jail. Repression is present, but deployed selectively. By and large, that has been Putin's modus operandi so far. And if he chooses to wade into an Afghanistan-like quagmire, he cannot but change the regime to a traditional authoritarianism, a police state where public opinion no longer matters. This is likely to be the most significant and troubling consequence of what we're seeing in Ukraine today. And again, um, I did not believe he was ready for this change. Um, and that was another reason for me to think that uh, he would not uh, attempt a full bore uh, invasion. Yet, if he does, this will be a classic Pyrrhic victory. When jazz was allowed in the Soviet Union for several uh, years during the World War II alliance with the US, the refrain in a song by a popular crooner, Leonid Utyosov, went, Kiton podavilis akula, the shark choked on the whale. Ukraine is almost certain to become that whale for Putin and this war beginning of the end of his regime. Russian history is both unambiguous and unforgiving where uh, military defeats are concerned. Virtually all of them precipitated regime change. Defeat in the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856, resulted in Alexander II's revolution from above, the plethora of liberalizing reforms, beginning with the manumission of serfs. The loss to Japan produced the first Russian revolution and forced Nicholas II to accede to a constitutional monarchy. The setbacks in World War I led to the February Revolution and uh, nine months later to the Bolshevik coup. And the widely hated war in Afghanistan um, became a key factor in Gorbachev's launching Glasnost and, and Perestroika, his revolution from above, which led to the demise of the Soviet Union. Uh, a history buff, Putin knows this story well, uh, which also made me think that he would not, or he would be reluctant to take that risk. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Um, I'm unsurprisingly, I agree with every single thing that you said. Um, I would worry about myself if I, if I find myself disagreeing with you materially. <clears throat> um, uh, I was also wrong in uh, in. Uh, my forecasting and the forecasting that I did um, along with uh, ISW's Russia team um, under the leadership of its terrific uh, team lead uh, analyst, Mason Clark. Um, uh, we have been assessing for months that Putin was unlikely to launch the full scale uh, ground invasion and occupation of Ukraine um, for various reasons. Um, some of them, uh, as, as uh, you laid out, Leon, some of them having to do with military technical issues about the way that Russian uh, ground forces in particular were arrayed around Ukraine. Um, I think, and so I'm honestly, as we're tracking this crisis, I'm also formulating in my mind 
and with the team, our own after action review to, uh, to determine exactly why we were wrong, um, which, we'll, which we will likely publish at some point, um, although it, it's mainly of interest to us, I think. Um, and I, I think at the moment, I'm inclined to say the primary factor that we got wrong is that Putin went crazy. Uh, that Putin changed his his he really has changed in some fundamental way. Russian has so many wonderful ways of putting things, and crazy in Russian is sumashedzi, which is literally uh, walked away from his mind. Um, and for some weeks, it's been it's dawned on me that actually he Putin I think really has walked away from his mind, in in a fundamental way, and that um, that sort of craziness has manifested itself in a number of ways, um, one of which is that he had so many other ways, he was setting up skillfully so many other ways of achieving the objective of regaining control of Ukraine without having to launch a dangerous and costly military operation. He was doing so well along so many of those non-military lines of advance that this is unnecessary. From the standpoint of actually regaining control of Ukraine, I assessed and continue to assess that uh, this was unnecessary. Uh, he was likely to be able to create a circumstance in Ukraine within a couple of years at a minimum in which the country was ungovernable um, and the current political order was cracking. There were Ukrainian elections for parliament scheduled for 2023 and then president 2024. Um, and it looked like, and I think this is true, that Putin's guys were setting uh, uh, informational and domestic conditions in Ukraine and in Europe and, and with us uh, to create a, a much more advantageous environment for him uh, to play around with in that time period. And that looked like, first of all, the kind of classic play that Putin has been doing for 20 years uh, and very much in accord with his preferred courses of action much less risky than what he's doing right now, and certainly much less costly. And for all of those reasons, uh, we assessed and forecast that he would not do what he is currently doing. Uh, and yet here he is. He has, in fact, launched the ground invasion. Um, uh, we've had uh, Russian troops advancing uh, along uh, at least five axes, uh, north from Crimea. Uh, they've pushed north and they're uh, driving toward the Dnipro River. I'm choosing to use, even though I'm, my background is in Russian, I'm choosing to use Ukrainian names for Ukrainian places. Um, so they're driving north toward the Dnipro River. They have attacked uh, Mariupol, not only uh, with missiles, but also by ground. Uh, they're attacking around uh, Kharkiv, uh, the second largest city in Ukraine, very close to the Russian border. And they're driving uh, south from Belarus and from Russia on Kyiv itself. Um, these operations so far are, they're not, it is not being conducted in the way that a competent professional military would conduct an operation. Uh, the ground operations began uh, within four hours of the start of the air campaign. Uh, they began before the Russians had secured air supremacy. So there have been Ukrainian combat aircraft flying around shooting at Russians. This is insanity on the Russians' part, and it's unnecessary. The Russians had the air and missile capability to destroy the Ukrainian Air Force's ability to operate, even if they didn't destroy all of the individual airframes. And they chose not to. They chose to uh, move ground forces forward in an environment in which there are Ukrainian combat aircraft still operable. This is, this is an unnecessary risk, and it's not something that a normal, competent, professional military would undertake. Uh, initial attempts to take Mariupol by ground were repulsed. This is also crazy. Uh, given the force concentrations that the Russians have down there and the ways that they could have approached that, there was no need for them to suffer initial uh, setbacks. Um, there are reports that they have been repulsed along other axes of advance. This is all temporary. I want to make it very clear that the Russians will win the conventional war here. Uh, the, the sheer uh, weight of forces that Putin has assembled around Ukraine is enough to grind the Ukrainians down. 
um, and and eventually destroy the conventional Ukrainian military and seize and occupy whatever positions in Ukraine Putin chooses to do. That Russia's ability to do that is not uh, in question. But I had a lot more respect for uh, Gerasimov, the Russian chief of the general staff, and I had a lot more respect for Zhuravlev, the commander of the Western Military District, and for Tvornikov, the commander of the Southern Military District. These guys fought in Syria. Uh, they're competent, professional military officers. They've written brilliantly about their experiences. Uh, these guys know better than this. And so I think this one of the second errors that I made in uh, my forecasting was not taking enough account of rumors and hints that we were getting that Putin was getting, quote, bad advice. And I really, I, I look forward to learning at some point in history who was actually giving him this advice. Was it Shoigu? Is it the, was it the Minister of Defense who is not a professional military man? Is he playing the, the Hermann Goering to, to Putin's Hitler here and, and providing the, the, the word that his boss wanted to hear? Yeah, Obudione to Stalin. Obudione to Stalin, I mean, right. There, yeah, there's a, there's a track record of this kind of thing. At least Budioni was a professional military man. Yeah. Shoigu, was, military man, but yeah, uh, yeah, but you know, Shoigu was a politician. I mean, he's yeah. been in this position for a long time. I, I have no evidence of this. Um, only, only little bits and pieces. But someone, I think, has been giving Putin bad advice, and so we have so far a surprisingly inept uh, opening campaign. Honestly, it's it, it reminds me more of the initial Soviet operations against Finland. Um, than anything else. Now, Ukraine is not Finland, uh, and this is in Stalin's Soviet Union. So Putin will lean into this, and I, I want to be very clear that we should expect that the Russians will win this conventional war, uh, and the Ukrainians will not be able to stop them. But I think that the prospects are much greater than I had feared, that the Ukrainians will be able to blood the Russians significantly in the process. And I think that's incredibly important for the reasons that Leon laid out. Uh, I don't think that th this is not looking like this is going to turn into, and we'll see. You should take everything I say with a grain of salt because I've just told you that my various forecasts have been wrong um, for some time. But this looks l unlikely to turn into a suddenly, uh, shockingly effective blitzkrieg uh, where the Russians will sort of shake it off, get their heads together, and then this will this will go smoothly. I think this will be ugly. Um, I, that is to say, I think the conventional phase of this will be ugly and the Ukrainians will be able to score a lot more hits than they should be able to given the correlation of forces and resources. But the, the Ukrainians will eventually be ground down. I agree with Leon that there will be a significant Ukrainian insurgency. Uh, Putin has stupidly done everything he could to ensure that that will be the case. Uh, the rhetoric that he has been using, if you ask yourself, you know, reflect on this. In 1941, Adolf Hitler invaded the Soviet Union at close to the height of the Stalinist purges. After Stalin de devastated, decimated, actually technically more than decimated, I think he killed more than one in 10 oh, yeah. of his officers, yeah. um, his military and done horrific things to his people. Stalin, nobody loved Stalin in the Soviet Union uh, except for his lackeys, and they feared him more than they loved him. Yet when the Germans invaded, the Russians fought like lions. Why? They were not fighting for Stalin. They were fighting against an adversary who had made it clear that his objective was to exterminate them like vermin. Putin has made a similar mistake in telling the Ukrainians what lies in store for them at the end of this war. He's not saying that he's going to exterminate them, but he's made it very clear that he intends to conquer them, subjugate them by force, and compel them to become uh, serfs in a renewed Russian Soviet empire. And he's made that clear in no uncertain terms. He's done nothing whatsoever to offer any positive vision to any but his lackeys and boot and bootlickers in Ukraine. And he's done more than that. He has assembled uh, the forces of a guy named Ramazan Kadyrov, a Chechen war criminal who specializes in atrocity. 
uh, on Ukraine's northern frontier. He's concentrated Kadyrov's guys in Belarus. Um, listen, there's only one thing that Kadyrov's guys know how to do. They know how to commit war crimes and atrocities. That is their professional expertise. And when you concentrate those guys uh, on a border and you make it clear that you intend to send them in, that's not going to persuade Ukrainians to surrender. That's going to persuade them to fight to the death. So I think that we're very likely to have uh, a move toward irregular warfare and insurgency here. And um, this is not going to be a short, uh, victorious war, as Leon said, with the consequences that I think Leon has described. Now, I think it's important to step back from the details of this and just make another observation that transcends the, the issue of Russia's future, which is, which is NATO's future. So we have a problem here. One problem is we, we can discuss the moral ethical position that we've adopted of writing Ukraine off and deciding that uh, the United States and the West is going to watch uh, Putin uh, just invade and subjugate an innocent, peaceful state that posed no threat to him. That is our formal position. Uh, and we can, we can discuss the moral ethical wisdom of that. We can also discuss this geostrategic wisdom of that, but it's beside the point because that's the decision that has been made and I'm confident that it's not going to be reversed. But we have to look beyond Ukraine because Ukraine is not the end. As Leon said, the objective, Putin's objective is not just to win Ukraine. It is to reconstitute an empire. Which empire? Well, that matters. Certainly the Soviet empire. If the Georgians are not currently quaking in their boots, they should be, because the Georgians were also mentioned by NATO in the uh, Bucharest statement as being promised NATO membership. Whenever this major phase ends, I fully expect Putin to look at Tbilisi and say, so, are we done with this now, or where are you? Uh, and I do think that at this point, Georgia will, would be an easy fight for Putin, even whatever difficulties his military encounters in Ukraine. And then the Baltics, listen, Americans, you need to internalize something. The world has changed. A key pillar of the post-Cold War world has just collapsed. The entire post-Cold War order was based on the reality that there was no significant Russian conventional military threat to NATO. Every single aspect of the post-Cold War order in Europe rested on that fact. NATO defense budgets rested on that fact. NATO military posture rested on that fact. American defense budgets have rested on that fact. American military posture has rested on that fact. What does it mean? If Putin took a force of the size that he now has, or even one considerably smaller, and targeted it at the Baltic states with the forces that we currently have there, we could not defend them. No. Worse than that, we could not defend Poland with the forces we currently have in theater. Another of Putin's favorites. And a former member unwillingly of the Tsarist empire. We could not defend Poland with the forces that we currently have in Europe. We could defend it with the might of um, the American military, but we would have to flow divisions into Europe to do that. We will have to do that. So as we continue to imagine that we're going to stop investing in readiness now, and we're going to focus on modernization, and we have to stop worrying about Europe and the Middle East, and we have to focus like a laser beam on Taiwan and China. No, we can't. We have to be prepared to defend NATO militarily against a Russian conventional threat for the first time since 1990. And that is a change in the world. And we're going to have to wrap our heads around it some way. Um, I think I'll stop there. I'm, I'm, and we've got lots of questions in the queue, Leon. So I think uh, maybe we should start addressing yeah, them. Yeah, you, you start, you start uh, clicking them. I think there's a first question. Essentially, 
uh, and I'm going to direct it to you, uh, Fred. Essentially, uh, we have we have people uh, on the left and on the right making excuses for Putin and essentially saying uh, it doesn't matter to the U.S. Uh, uh, what happens there. So, so I think the questioner wants us to um, weigh in on to why why that matters. Look, Ukraine matters to to the United States for a number of reasons. One of them is, I've you know I've said this so many times, but it bears repeating. There has been no greater beneficiary of the rules based international order than the United States of America and the American people. We are the ones who have benefited from that most. We are the ones who have the most to lose from the destruction of the rules based international order. What Putin is establishing is the is the Hobbesian principle of international relations. Okay, the strong will devour the weak. And as the Russians sometimes say candidly when speaking privately, only great powers have sovereignty. Okay, that that is a world of war. That is a world on fire. And it will not be confined to Ukraine. First of all, Putin has made it clear, as I just said, that he has targets beyond Ukraine, and some of them include NATO countries. So the United States will rapidly be faced with the choice of adhering to the alliance, which is the gold standard by which all other American defensive commitments are judged. And we need to understand something about NATO because we've taken it for granted for 30 years. There is a legal category in the United States of major non-NATO ally. And I just want to mention, what does that mean? What is the implication of that? The implication of that is that the American commitment to NATO is the standard by which all other American commitments will be measured. It is the highest level of commitment the United States can give to any country. That commitment has not been in question for 30 years, for much longer than that, in fact. If it comes into question, all of our commitments will be shaken. Our commitment to Japan will be shaken. Our commitment to South Korea will be shaken. Our commi- all of our commitments will be shaken. Xi Jinping will pay attention to that. He is paying attention to this. Khamenei will pay attention to that. He is paying attention to this. And we can say all of these things don't matter, but you know, that's just a fictional world in which they don't matter. Because the global economy matters to the United States and the destruction of it will matter to Americans. President Biden has been making this case partially. One could make it more loudly. So there are legal, moral, ethical, geostrategic, and practical economic reasons why this matters a great deal to Americans. And we we need to uh, find a way to internalize that. Um, uh, Fred, I, I think you see the questions, right? Yeah. Um, I think you pretty much answered the question about Taiwan, why, why it matters to Taiwan, um, if, if you want to say more. But but what else the U.S. should be doing now? And um, what's, what, what's available to, to the Biden administration? To be sure, with all those things that you mentioned, it, it, it may be too little too late. Well, you know, I mean, it's given that, the, that we are not going to fight Russia to defend Ukraine, we we can't save Ukraine. We should continue, as I believe the administration is doing, uh, to rush aid to Ukraine and to turn this into Putin's Afghanistan war um, and to provide the Ukrainians as best we can with the resources to make this a very bloody and painful fight uh, and defend their own country as they as they are. Um, Putin is threatening hellfire against anybody who helps them, and we need to stand up to that threat and help them anyway. Um, but beyond that, listen, we need to be mobilizing American, uh, I, I hate to say this, but this is reality, we need to be mobilizing right now American mechanized divisions and flowing them to NATO's eastern flank, not to invade Russia, not to defend Ukraine, not to attack, but to make it very clear to Putin that this stops here. That this this is it. We're we're no, we're not going to play games anymore. We're recognizing what an inflection this is. This needs to be the 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 Iran revolution moment for Joe Biden. This because you know one of the remarkable things that people often forget about Jimmy Carter is that after the Iranian revolution broke out, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, Jimmy Carter realized that his strategy had been wrong. 
And he began what, what became the Reagan military buildup. And he began a change in American military policy and posture. That needs to happen now. We need to recognize that uh, coercive economic diplomacy has failed and that sometimes you need to bring a gun to a gunfight. And again, I'm not saying that we should be fight, you know, sending armored divisions to fight in Ukraine. I am saying that we need to send them right now to Poland and make it clear that we will stand against Putin uh, if he tries anything else. Uh, Fred, that reminds me of, of Reagan's favorite. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not easy, but it's simple. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, a couple of couple of notes. I can't. I mean, you you you're always so provoking me to uh, to to at least try and say something interesting. Um, and not to compare Putin to to those two monsters, but what you're describing of Putin um, uh, going off his head, it, it reminded me first of all of Stalin during the forty one until Zhukov saved Moscow, and at, at at which point essentially apparently there were some words. Essentially, Zhukov told him not to mess around. Um, and God knows where he got the courage to say that. But I think I think Stalin at that time was expecting uh, <laughs> to be running to uh, to uh, uh, Volga to uh, save his life. So he allowed Zhukov to do it. It, it also allowed me uh, remember me of Hitler 42, 43, with the with the constant orders not to uh, retrieve from Stalingrad, even at the obvious at the obvious um, uh, danger and threat. Of being encircled, there, which is exactly was was of course Zhukov's plan, and exactly happened in, in December Jan, December uh, forty two uh, January forty three. So so they do have. I mean, you're in power for twenty two years, Fred. Uh, show me somebody who is not a little bit um after after that much in power. Who advises him? Uh, as part of my research, his KGB buddies, Patrushev, Bortnikov. Yep. Uh, he does again again. As Hitler and Stalin, he does not trust professional military. So, uh, if you, I mean, unless you want to say something, but I think you already covered Russia, China, uh, and and Axis powers being emboldened, um, and you see that question directly addressed to you, I believe. Uh, which about uh, when? When will he win the convention? I'm sure that Russia will. Yeah. Win the, yeah. Okay. I, I I can't I can't give you an estimate because. <clears throat> we're going to have to see what the what the russians actually do here it in principle they seem to have begun this operation before all of their forces were fully in place especially for the drive on kiev um so and i want to be very careful here because i want to tell you i mean i want to remind those of you who don't remember in 2003 when the united states began uh the attack and we did a brief and very intense uh, air campaign and then we rolled forward. Um, there were pauses in our operation. And uh, in the midst of those pauses, this also happened in 1991. Uh, in the midst of those pauses, we, we had reporters saying, oh, look, it's already a quagmire. It's Vietnam. Um, you know, the, it's this, the Americans have already screwed up and, and they're not going to complete the invasion, which turned out to be ridiculously wrong in both cases. Um, so I want to be, be careful not to make that mistake here. Um, I'm assuming, because we will, we don't have visibility on this, that the Russians are in fact now concentrating uh, the various forces that were not yet ready and hurrying to move them uh, forward. And if they do that, then it can be a matter of a few days or a week uh, before the Russians are able to drive enough power through uh, the Ukrainian defenses to overwhelm them. Um, so it, it really could be anything from, from a couple of days to a week. But if the Russian ground forces continue to sort of mess around the way that they have been uh, with little bits and pieces here or there, it could take a lot longer. There's also a question about whether Putin is trying to do this slowly because he doesn't want to get drawn into big combats and he doesn't want to get drawn into urban warfare and he's hoping to break the Ukrainians' will and get them to collapse or something, uh, and possibly Patrushev or um, Narishkin, the FSB director, who just was if he's still, if he's still there. <laughs> well, Stalin would have dealt with that with a nine millimeter uh, solution. I, I, I'm I'm a little surprised that Narishkin is still alive, but um, you know those guys may be telling Putin that they've got some brilliant scheme to take Zelensky down and and do so. 
I don't know. Um, so it's very hard to say. This this could be the conventional phase could be over in a couple of days. Uh, it could be going on a couple of weeks from now. Um, but the, the, it really depends on how rapidly the Russians concentrate their power and how effectively they can actually wield it. Uh, and it's just too early to tell at this point. Um, let me let me just weigh in on something that Fred said. Um, as part of my research uh, for the last two chapters of the book, um, I, I looked at every study of, of uh, possible Russian action in the Baltics. <laughs> I, I just want our, our, our viewers and listeners to understand that, that there are rotating battalions in, in, in all those three countries. There are about 1,000 uh, troops from various countries um, and uh, without air power, without heavy um, equipment, and so on and so forth. Um, facing them uh, uh, is uh, 340,000 uh, strong um, uh, Western military district. Um, the only thing, and, and there, you know, there are all kinds of studies of how quickly the Russians can do it, um, but, but the only thing that can possibly deter Putin, and I totally agree here with Fred, is to deploy enough, actually, Rand said, eight brigades uh, with their support, tanks, artillery, to tell Putin that he cannot do it quick and easy. Um, and he might be repulsed on the conventional first phase um, because after that, you know, there are all kinds of things that show that it will take three to four months um, to, uh, for NATO to fully mobilize and bring its forces. By then, again, here's the um, playbook from Crimea, uh, that part of, of uh, whether it's uh, Estonia or Latvia uh, will have a so-called referendum uh, asking to join uh, Russia. It becomes part of Russia. And, and then you have to go to war with Russia. Uh, which again, I, I, I think NATO is probably not going to do. Um, so there is there is urgency here. Um, my sense is that uh, again, uh, this small victorious war, I thought it would be closer to the 2024 election to provide kind of you know spectacular uh, outburst of patriotic um, uh, uh, feelings, and it's wrong on two scores. It's too early, and it's not likely to provide uh, that sort of thing because because. The Russian troops are not fighting the NATO. I'm sorry, not fighting NATO. They are the Russians have pretty much given up on the Baltics, um, and and uh, uh, there is there is there is a, a sense um, that uh, uh, it will have to be uh, will have to be done uh, very quickly. Um, when will we, if we ever see those eight brigades, or hopefully more, uh, deployed in in the Baltics? I, I'll. I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it to Fred, but I think it's very unlikely. I, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So uh, we have the question of, again, Fred, everybody is, and I don't blame them. They're all interested in the nitty gritty, uh, the infrastructure, right? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Why hasn't, why hasn't Russia targeted critical infrastructure like electrical power? I can't tell you. Um, this is something that is in a, in a standard playbook. Um, I expected them to do this. I, I think we have clearly seen, look, it's very clear that, that I think, I want to be careful saying very clear. It looks to me as if the Putin is trying to do this in as limited a way as he can to cause as few casualties as he can. Uh, to do strikes in a way that demonstrate that the Ukrainians will lose, to break their will, but without uh, really sort of devastating the country. Because, of course, you know, his objective, I mean, we do need to remember that now. So I'm, I'm scared to say this because so far a lot of my assumptions about Putin's feeling. Personality? To, well, yeah, but the feeling that he needs to stick within any of the narratives that he's created. Uh, have been wrong, but I I think it's important to th to reflect on the narratives here, which also will answer another question about what is his objective. Mm -hmm. um, look, like Hitler, and I'm very comfortable making that analogy, by the way, even though Putin is not engaging in genocide uh, here, and I don't think intends to. Um, but like Hitler, Putin is telling us exactly what it is that he's going for. There, there, we shouldn't be confused about this. Mm -hmm. um, and his speeches this week have been um, insane. But have also, you know, made the clear the objective, and it's hard to read, the, especially the speech last night or the brief speech last night and the one immediately before that, as anything other than declarations of intent to annex Ukraine into Russia in some way. 
I'm not actually persuaded that he is even thinking that he can set up some sort of puppet government and have that be a final solution uh, for him. It may be an interim step, but the the complete destruction in his in his rhetoric of any support for any kind of sovereign Ukrainian state uh, leaves him relatively little room for a solution other than breaking Ukraine into provinces and bringing them separately into the Russian Empire. Um, well, you know, again, I'm saying that he's walked off his mind, but it's it's still it's still within limits. I think there's still a bounded rationality here. And when one is trying to conquer a country to absorb it, it's desirable to destroy as little of it as possible. And if he has the notion, and this is, I think, one of the potential miscalculations, if he has had the notion whispered to him by Patrushev or others that, you know, most Ukrainians really are under to understand that they're Russians. Most Ukrainians really are with him mm-hmm. and they're not going to fight for this corrupt oligarchic government and all of that sort of stuff. If he actually believes that, Remember, the speech yesterday began with a call to Ukrainian service members to put down their arms. Okay, I mean, I get that. You can do that, but it's cra- it's that crazy way to begin an announcement of a war when it we know that they're not going to do that, and they have, certainly haven't done that. So I think it's possible that he's trying to sneak up on this in a way and create conditions that he hopes will cause Ukrainians to surrender without doing too much damage. Um and like that. The only other thing I can say about why he hasn't taken down the critical infrastructure like electrical power communications is we had assumed that he would. Of course, if you think that you're going to operate heavily in an information domain, and if you think that you're going to try to influence the attitudes of the population that you're attacking, you have to have some means of doing that. And if you shut off everybody's communications, then you can't talk to them either. So I I want to hold open the possibility that he actually feels the need to maintain a line of communication to the Ukrainian people because he needs to communicate with them or wants to be able to. I'm grasping at straws here because none of this is a sort of doctrinal military approaches to these problems or anything that we would have expected the Russians to do. Uh, Let me start um, on on one question here and then then I'll um, uh, kick it to you, uh, Fred. Uh, offensive missile. So one thing that Putin mentioned in his diatribe uh, speech, uh, the long diatribe speech, uh, was that A, Ukrainians have a Tochka uh, missile, which I think is a very old Russian uh, uh, missile, tactical missile, and that the, and that they have some residual military, I'm sorry, uh, nuclear uh, components, which I think they surrendered under the, uh, under the uh, Bucharest uh, 1994 uh, um, uh, uh, treaty. So, fr- I mean, they lied about, you know, for example, Shoigu, uh, uh, I mean, it's a typical Gleibitz operation of Hitler's. Uh, Shoigu uh, in the, in the um, that infamous, and I, I want everybody to see that sitting of the, of the National Security Council. Uh, very interesting. Um, it's on YouTube. And, uh, and Shoigu said, oh, yes, there was a terrorist group that was trying to, to infiltrate Russia. We, we killed all of them. We, we got one um, as, a, uh, as a prisoner of war. So, so Putin might as well um, like, uh, lied about uh, the missiles and the nuclear, nuclear wherewithal. What do you think, uh, Fred? Oh, yeah. No, that's nonsense. I mean, it's a combination of, and it was interesting to, be, to note, by the way, that, I don't know, it was six or eight weeks ago. Lavrov, the foreign minister, uh, actually referred explicitly to the movie Wag the Dog. Um, and he was talking about, uh, he was accusing us of doing that. But of course, Putin is doing that too. And it a lot of this, the nuclear discussion that they're having right now reminds me very much of the, and this has nothing to do with the B-3 bomber uh, uh, scene in Wag the Dog, um, which has all the reporters going, what's the B-3 bomber? And then they go off and start asking questions. And of course, there is no B-3 bomber. The point is to distract everybody. Uh, the, Ukraine has no nuclear capabilities. Um, what Shoigu keyed off, of, you, uh, Zelensky made a rhetorical mistake. And I th- actually think he misspoke. I, he may be wrong, but he did refer uh, in his own speech a few days ago to the Budapest Mem- Memorandum in which Ukraine agreed uh, to give up all of its nuclear weapons uh, in exchange for guarantees from Russia, among others, uh, of, of its territory. 
Um, and Zelensky made a comment in a speech a few days ago that uh, it might be necessary to revisit uh, the Budapest Memorandum. I don't know what he was actually talking about. I and I, I don't want to go too far speculating, but the Russians immediately seized on that as saying that the, Zelensky was saying that Ukraine was going to acquire a nuclear weapon. And then they got, then they went into just total crazy pants land. And Shoigu said that the Ukrainians could acquire nuclear weapons faster than Iran or North Korea. Well, uh, okay, North Korea has nuclear weapons. So it, it's not physically possible to acquire weapons faster than North Korea has them. Um, so this is this is a nonsense, and this is all a part of the um, of the effort that the Russians have been engaged in to persuade anybody that Ukraine poses some sort of a threat to Russia that justifies this invasion. But Leon, this is the thing that has baffled me as I've watched this. So they 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 set up all of these false flag provocations. They had this invasion of Russia by these bunch of of, of idiot Ukrainians, which I don't think even happened. Um, and all of these provocations. They've got legal cases going on as they review these kinds of things. They've got the accusations that the Ukrainians are going to acquire nuclear weapons. They said all sort. They started all sorts of hairs that in a, a couple of years ago, they would have spent time elaborating these into full-scale information operations where you have Ukrainian ser- Ukrainian service members confessing on 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 you know channel one to their plot, and you have evidence presented of the Ukrainian nuclear weapons and all of that kind of stuff. And then they go to the United Nations and say that Ukraine has done all of this kind of stuff. And they did. they started all of these things. And then Putin just chucked them all, waited for none of them to come to fruition and just launched in a way that left them all kind of as hanging chads. Mm-hmm. The only explanation that I can offer there is I do want to give the Biden administration credit for one thing here. Uh, there, actually, it deserves credit for a number of things, um, and I, it's, it's important to give them the credit that they do deserve. But in one respect, there has they have been fighting an information war against Putin that Putin has never seen anyone fight against him before. And the Biden administration has been aggressively blowing all of these false flag operations, identifying when the Russians were going to stage a coup, telling Zelensky that telling the world. And I think at that National Security Council meeting, when Putin rips the face off of Narishkin, the FSB director who's in charge of running most no, of no, these things. No, SVR. SVR. SVR director who's in charge of running most of these things. Um, I have a theory. I think Putin was actually very angry at Narishkin because Narishkin has blown it repeatedly. Narishkin was, I think, supposed to make all kinds of things happen, like a coup, like an actual Ukrainian provocation, like all of this stuff. And we got inside, of, we, the U.S., got inside of all of Narishkin's games and blew them all up before they could come to fruition. And I think that this may be one of the reasons why Putin just said, OK, screw it. We're going. I don't care. I don't care about these operations. And I had lost patience with Narishkin and then humiliated him publicly. It's a it's a thin it's thin gruel to to make much of an argument on, but I think that that's one of the things that's going on uh, here. So we need to be very careful not to fall for these various Russian information operations about the Ukrainian nuclear weapons and missiles and so on. Um, uh, Fred, uh, looking at the the bunch of uh, the la- la- last three questions. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you, of course, weigh in. Uh, just one. My sense is that no, it's not going to spill into Poland and the Baltic states. Um, uh, too much on the plate already. Um, and um, I, I don't think we're we're going to attack Venezuela or Cuba uh, um, uh, to to stretch the Russians. He, it's all rhetorical. He doesn't care much about either. I don't think. Th- well. Listen, I'm a little bit more concerned about the possibility of this expanding to involve um, NATO states one way or another. Look, the harder a slog the Russians make this in Ukraine, the less concerned I am about Putin immediately turning to do anything else. The risk that I saw was that if they actually did turn this into a splendid little, you know, sort of blitzkrieg operation, that Putin might feel emboldened to move rapidly somewhere else. 
Um, but I, unless that, unless this becomes that, I think he's not going to be inclined to do that. But look, I do think that it is virtually certain that the polls are going to lean into backing the Ukrainian insurgency. Um, Putin is going to be furious about that. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, as a measure of the incompetence of, of Putin's information operations, even Hungary's Orban <laughs> condemned the invasion. That's a big deal because Putin had so thoroughly suborned Orban mm -hmm. that I would not have bet a kopeck one way or the other on how Orban would react to this. But Putin has done this in such a ham-fisted way that even Orban found it necessary to do that. Orban may also find it necessary, therefore, to support uh, resistance, um, which I, in principle he would prefer not to do. Uh, so I think we're going to have NATO states involved, I think, directly in supporting uh, insurgency in Ukraine, as they should and as we should. Uh, Putin will announce that that is an act of war. He will announce that those are provocations and he will, he will do various things. We cannot take off the table, and I just want to reiterate this. I don't want to be hyperbolic, and I don't want to be alarmist here, but I just want to say I, we need to shake ourselves out of our complacency and recognize that the NATO line is not a magical curtain that automatically defends NATO states. And this, Leon, you were making this point superbly in your book and in the scenario that you described. We have to understand that the, 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 the days when no one could ever think about attacking NATO country are passing and i and we need to we, you, what you're saying is exactly right if putin conducted an incursion into poland for example if russian forces drove northwest from grodna in belarus to link up with the russian forces in kaliningrad and established their own sort of land bridge between those two that cuts off the nato ground line of communication to the baltics and we are then in a position of having to counterattack against Russian forces to reopen it. You're talking about the so-called Suvalki. The Suvalki, Suvalki yeah. corridor, yes. The Suvalki, right. From our perspective, it's a corridor. From the Russian perspective, <laughs> it's a gap. Um, <laughs> okay. But the, the Suvalki corridor, which is, it, it's separate. If you look at a map, and I'm sorry we don't have a map up, but if you look at a map, it there is a thin strip of territory uh, in where Poland and Lithuania actually have a direct border and there's a rail and a road line there and the nearest town is Suwalki in Poland. We need that rail and, and, uh, and road uh, corridor to get reinforcements into the Baltic states. The Russian objective will be to cut it. If they did that now and if we, or at some time soon, and if we had then to contemplate a counterattack to take territory away from them, that it's not a crazy scenario to imagine that Putin might do that. And we need to be prepared for that militarily, and we're not prepared for that now. Now, the Biden administration is sending more forces to Europe, which is good, um, but I fear that the scale is too small of those forces. And I, I'm afraid that they may not be the kinds of forces that are required uh, to conduct mechanized counterattacks uh, against Russian uh, positions. And this is very worrisome. So I am worried about this spilling over. And I, we cannot take for granted that that isn't uh, going to happen. Uh, Fred, just, just to um, add to what you said, uh, there's been a, actually started under Medvedev, um, there's been a steady stuffing of Kaliningrad with yeah. hardware, um, including, and that again happened under Medvedev, the Iskander um, dual, dual use um, uh, tactical missiles. Um, I was told, uh, actually, when I traveled in the Baltics uh, researching this book, I forgot two minutes to, to reach uh, Tallinn or something yeah. to that effect. Yeah. Um, so an enormous danger um, from, from Kaliningrad. Now, I don't see any more questions. Uh, I'd be happy to, <laughs> to chat with you, but I think we probably need some guidance uh, from our, um, our hosts to see if um, we continue or or we just um, stop here because because there are no more questions. Well, there are there are a couple of other questions that we that we could address, I think. Um, okay. the, the question about um, will a re-emerging German military uh, oh yes, that's right, that's right. Uh, you know become indispensable. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean it, it is important to say I'm 
saying that the United States is going to have to relook its defense budget and its force posture. We we are the country that can most rapidly build up its military and most rapidly deploy. And yes, we can afford to do this. Um, we've been telling ourselves that we can't, but that is a choice. Uh, and we need to make a different choice right now. We can do this much more rapidly than the European states are going to be able to build up militarily, but they have to. And the reason why I focus on what we have to do, and I want to be very clear about this, we only control ourselves. The United States is not an empire, and we don't dictate policies to our allies. We ask them to do things. We suggest that they do things. We put pressure on them to do things. But we don't control them. So we have to affect what it is that we can control. And that's why I focus on what we can do, because I don't like to try to conduct national security policy in the subjunctive, talking about what other people should do. But I will do that here and say, the Europeans should get their heads out of the um, sand and recognize that the universe has changed and that they are also going to have to think about bringing guns to a gunfight. And it is time for the Germans to get over the post-World War II uh, hangover. And I think actually Bill Galston had a terrific um, op-ed about this a few days ago uh, in which he said, you know, he said, as it, he said, this is, this is Bill Galston saying, you know, as a Jew born one year after 1945, it shocks me to say that it's very important for the Germans to get over the lessons of the Second World War. <laughs> um, but but he, he is absolutely right. Uh, Germany is the largest economy in Europe. It has the greatest potential military power. Um, it has, since the Second World War, been committed to not doing that. And I've been largely in favor of that, because if you look at the recent sweep of European history, uh, Europe has been more peaceful when Germany has been relatively disarmed. Um, but the reality is I'm not worried about a German, uh, at the re, you know, re-engaging in some kind of aggressive activity in Europe. I, I, that's not something that we need to be worried about. I am worried about defending against Russian aggression now. And Germany is going to have to gird its loins and look itself in the eye and decide uh, if it is going to play the role that it should play. France, and I built, Galston made this, it was really it was a commended to everyone. It's a terrific op-ed. Um, uh, France is also going to have to get past the, the Gaulism and decide that it's just it's a member of NATO without an, without an asterisk. Um, because the, the French, there has been an, a, an asterisk in the minds of the French about French membership in NATO and responsibilities to NATO ever since de Gaulle, and that needs to end. Um, and the French need to commit to NATO, and they need to commit to being a military power in NATO and invest in it. And of course, the British need to need to step up their military defenses too. This has to happen. Europe has to rearm to defend itself. Um, and, and Germany does need to lead the way, but it's going to be a hard slog. I see we managed to prompt another couple of questions. Um, all right. Um, it, again, Fred, um, um, please weigh in. Um, we take turns. Uh, tactical nuclear weapons to defend Poland, the answer is no. Although, again, as part of my book research, one of the chapters is, is called Worshipping the Nukes. Um, Putin's been... Well, partly because that's the only superpower legacy he had. He is now trying to create more. But on worshiping, really, um, Saint Seraphim of Sarov is now patron saint of Russian nuclear weapons. I have a few paragraphs on this. And Putin went to the monastery. Uh, why, why, um, why Sarov? Because that's where the father, the real father of the of the uh, Russian nuclear weapons, uh, Lavrenti Beria. Um, that's where he set so-called set up so-called Arzamas 47, the super secret town, where among others Sakharov worked, um, but also of course Kurchatov and a number of others. Um, they of course, you know, all the all the nuns and all the monks were killed. Um, the monasteries and churches were desecrated, and then Putin said, "What the hell? I'm a born Christian," um, uh, and he and the um, holiest father, the patriarch mm -hmm. of Russia. I, I unfortunately on that one I don't have a photo, but I certainly have a write-up uh, from from one of the Russian news agencies. They presided over the opening of the Seraphim's uh, uh, um, monastery, and then waved to the parade of monks and nuns. Uh, he is uh, talking of of going off his rocker. He literally worships the nukes, um, and one of the tactical 
or, or operational consequence of that, and again, Alfred, you, I'm sure you know more about this, is this very determined development of, of tactical nuclear weapons, um, uh, including, including, we're talking about really short range, very low yield. And again, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this, but what I hear from, from or read from the experts is that that's, that's a very suspicious development. In other words, you go in and you explode, perhaps in the area that, that's not populated, assuming, right? Uh, or sparsely populated. You, you explode, you know, at 0 0.2, 0 0.3 um, uh, megaton, uh, just to scare off NATO and, and, and show what, what you're up to. What do you think? It's Russian stated doctrine to do that at this point. Um, it's the, the the Russian the Russian military writings about this are quite clear. Correct. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Right. In response to a conventional attack, which in their opinion threatens the very existence of the Russian state. Well, right. apparently Ukraine. Uh, uh, exactly. Is, uh, ex exactly. Putin will threaten this. This is a very important point. Uh, if we get to the point where NATO is actually confronting Putin militarily and it looks like uh, things might not go well for him, Putin will threaten nuclear war. Okay. We've, first of all, I want to say I am, <laughs> again, I'm pretty confident, although less confident than I had been, uh, that Putin is not going to push the button and launch global annihilation at any point. I don't think that he's walked off his mind or will walk off his mind sufficiently uh, to do any such a thing, but he will threaten it. Um, we've got to decide something up front. We've got to decide that um, we're willing to accept that risk and that we're even willing to accept the risk that Putin will use the tactical nuclear weapon and that we will respond however we will respond. There's no need for us to respond with nuclear weapons uh, to that kind of tactical nuclear weapons use, and we shouldn't. Um, but we need to accept the risk that he will threaten that and the risk that he will even do it. Because if we decide that we're not willing to run that risk, then we might as well surrender it all right now. Of course. Of course. Because this, he's going to do this. And we need, this is something else. I'm, I'm say, we've got to, we've, it's a terrible thing to say. But this is the world that Putin is creating. And I, I don't think that we can simply surrender uh, to, to that threat. All right, uh, Fred, Fred, you see those questions. Yep. Yeah, yeah. How much? Yeah. yeah we, have, we have actually, I wish we had, we had our wonderful um, China scholars. Um, I think China was just, just very amateurishly, um, and I'm looking forward to what you have to say. I, I think China will, com will, will not comply with some and comply with others. Uh, for example, I could give you, uh, if we indeed are, are hitting hard now and we are um, um, uh, banning Vnestorbank uh, and Sberbank, uh, I believe the total of about over $700 billion um, one way or another, uh, uh, we're banning, uh, buying their debt, uh, in other words, uh, their, their um, uh, whatever, whatever uh, uh, obligations they sell, uh, I think, in fact, I remember, if I remember correctly, in 2014, uh, China complied with, with, with some of those financial measures and the banks were very, uh, I think, almost stopped lending um, to uh, Russian companies or financing Russian endeavors. I think on other things, uh, there was just news about, about China buying a huge chunk of, of Russian grain, which apparently is also now, as, a, as an export, is banned. So I think China will tread um, uh, very carefully, and this brings me to my favorite bet noir, uh, which is which is the alliance between Russia and China. China has so much more to lose from from allying itself with a vetoed, banned, sanctioned state. Its embeddedness in world economy is so much wider and sophisticated than Russia's, which essentially short. Uh, by the way, even now can sell its oil and gas. Although we'll, you know, we'll see how the, how how um, uh, serious uh, Germans are in, in in shutting off temporarily um, uh, Nord Stream too. So so my sense is that the the Chinese will pick and choose on this. I'm not a China expert. I, I the the only thing I know is that the Chinese since 2014 we have had an axis of opposing sanctions among China, Iran, and Russia, and North Korea. 
that is very strong. And, and those countries have all been leading a charge to try to basically make sanctions of any sort illegal. Um, and the Chinese, of course, are worried about sanctions against them um, as, as parts of things that we might do. So I think the Chinese are going to be very resistant uh, publicly as they have been. I mean, they're going to continue to reject publicly the legitimacy of sanctions. Um, in terms of what they actually do, I agree with you. I, I don't think that she is interested in losing a lot of bank, bank for Putin um, on this uh, war. Um, and again, I mean, this goes back to the way that Putin has done this. He's given she no cover to defend him. This is so outrageously and overtly an unprovoked act of, of aggression that Putin is engaged in that I think she is finding it is, is going to find it hard to provide Putin the kind of cover that he otherwise might be inclined to. Um, so I, I, I think you're right, but I, 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 we have people who know much more about China than I do, so I, I won't continue on. Um, I'll take the, I'll move to the last question, I think, yes. which is, um, the question is, can, can we revisit the statement that both the right and the left of the U.S. political spectrum do not believe this matters to our nation and that they will be against any military action by U.S. troops? Um, look, we will see what coverage of this war does to people. Uh, I have said, I have been saying all along that people, a lot of people were having trouble imagining how the world will change after Putin conducts an attack like this and it is televised and everyone can see what is going on. And we'll see if I'm right about that. Um, I am noticing a steady coalescing uh, in many places on both sides of the political spectrum here against what Putin is doing. And once again, he has done so much to strip himself of any sort of plausible cover for any other, for any of those who are other than outright isolationists or who are, who are just prepared to repeat Russian propaganda lines of which I wish I had said uh, the Gary Kasparov quote. Um, they don't sound better in the original Russian. Um, other than those, than the than the people who are going to be willing to continue to do that, I think that it's we're going to see an erosion of opposition uh, to U.S. Uh, resistance to the Russian aggression. Since the Biden administration has taken off the table fighting for Ukraine, that isn't going to happen, and we're not going to have to have a political argument about that. I think that probably would be divisive, and I, I think a lot of people would be opposed to it. Um, and but it's not on the table. We're not going to do that. Uh, as that becomes apparent and the question becomes defending NATO, I suspect we'll find that the proportion of Americans who are prepared to say that we should not defend NATO against an unprovoked Russian attack will be low. And especially as we watch the, the Russian continued destruction of, of Ukraine um, and Putin's fulminations and threats, I, I hope that I'm right about this, but I don't think we're going to see a growing of isolationist sentiment in this regard. I think we're going to see a swelling, at least in the short term, of support for defending uh, NATO and America's allies and standing up to, uh, you know, this 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 aggressor at this time. So I think we will we will not see a lot of, of opposition to military action by U.S. troops to defend NATO countries, at least in the short term. Um, and the issue of defending, you know, fighting to defend Ukraine is not going to be on the table. Well, what should we do? Uh, I think if there are no more questions, we uh, we can we can wrap. Let's see if there is any guidance. Okay. Okay. Leon, thank you so much. Um, it's a terrible day. Uh, but uh, I'm thrilled to have had the opportunity to, to learn from you and, and discuss uh, discuss this from you. And I look forward to reading your book, which uh, is incredibly timely. And, and congratulations. Well, thanks very much, Fred, probably a year from now. But uh, delighted always to hear you. And actually, this is this is the longest uninterrupted uh, uh, <laughs> row of Kaganisms that, uh, that, that I've had. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity, Fred. Thanks very much, and thanks for all of you who watched. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Yep.